Uh, how you doing, everybody? I'm Christopher Ian Bennett with the Vancouver Film School. This is the Storyteller Studio podcast. And today we've got an awesome guest, Mr. Omari Newton. Omari is one of the ultimate working actors. And I say that not facetiously. This is a guy who not only uh, works day in and day out on screen. This is one of the most interesting and eclectic actors we've had in the studio before. You do a ton of voiceover stuff, and in particular in the in the animated world. And you've got a really, really cool bio, Omari. And I wanted to talk today about um, you know, storytelling through voice. I wanted yeah. to talk about, you know, how to become a successful voiceover actor, not just an actor for film and television, which you you've done plenty of that too, but you've really found kind of a a, a, a niche mm -hmm. where I th it feels like maybe that's almost like where you're focusing more. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, it's it's totally where I've been focusing the last couple of years, actually. And uh, I mean, I By the through... way, welcome to the podcast. Oh, yeah, thanks. It's good yeah, to be you're here. Wel you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, it's interesting. I would advise to any actor that's interested in doing voiceover to train in theater and to do lots of live theater. Because the, the funny thing about voice is in theater – we call what they call like voiceover sessions just like a staged reading where you don't have to memorize your lines you know you you're, you're standing there in front of a, a mic stand the only difference yeah. between like doing a cartoon and doing a staged reading is they record and you get multiple takes of a cartoon so it's like i feel like i'm getting paid lots of money for rehearsal when i do cartoon voices so let's jump right into that too let's talk about this for a minute mm -hmm. you you get a part we'll, we'll come back to auditions later you sure. get a part you are now a character in an animated uh series yes um, when you go to actually do it, mm -hmm. I've seen lots of those behind the scenes things for different, whatever, Pixar, Disney type stuff. And sometimes it's just the actor in a booth. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you see the, the, the cast like as an ensemble. Mm -hmm. Have you done both of those models? I have. Yeah. Which, which do you like better? I would think being alone is hard. Well, it's, it's interesting in terms of efficiency, being alone is fun. Because you could realistically, if you're doing a half an hour script, usually they do them in like three hour sessions. So if you're doing two episodes of a show in one day, you'll go from, you know, nine to noon. Then you'll have a lunch break. The studio will provide lunch. You do episode one. They'll do the second episode after lunch. Right. But realistically, in a voiceover script, if you're not like the main person, you could do all of your lines in an hour if you're by yourself. Now, yeah. what you lose, uh, what you get in efficiency, you lose in terms of like dynamics and just kind of, you know, the interplay with other characters. So there's pros and cons to both methods of doing it. Most of the time in the shows that I've done, the majority of the cast is in studio together. Uh, but s oftentimes now, because of technology, there's somebody patching in from L.A. or Toronto, yeah. depending on where they're at. When, if you're a hands model, mm -hmm. you have nice hands and somebody tells you, you should be a hands model. <laughs> right. How did you get into voice work? Like, did, right. did you choose to do that? Or did somebody go, oh man, your voice is like butter. Like, So here's a, here's a funny story. I'm going to go all the way back now. Take me back. I was born with polyps on my vocal cords. Oh. So until I had surgery when I was in the third grade. But you know when you meet those little kids who have this voice like this? No. Oh, well, you know how, like, sometimes you see those, those kids. kids who went to different schools. Yeah, they were on the, the different bus. Yeah. yeah. So I was one of those kids that had, like, that raspy, strange voice. Oh, wow. And I would lose my voice constantly, and I, I loved singing, and I loved acting, but I could never get good parts because my voice was really weak. Oh, and you're I would, kidding. I would, it's a true story. Then in the third grade... How ironic. I know. It's, it's quite ironic, right? Yeah. But I was, like, a nerd, so I used to watch a lot of cartoons, and I would try to do them, but my voice just wasn't whatever. I had surgery in the third grade to remove the polyps of my vocal cords, and I remember talking to my elementary school nurse, and in her infinite wisdom, she told me, your voice sounds so much better now. Like, you'll never be like an actor or a singer, <laughs> but you sound so much better. So I don't know if that, like, planted an F.U. bug in me, but I, I always wanted to do it, and after having the surgery, I felt like I was, like, liberating to do it. Starting off doing, in high school, uh, sketch comedy, improv, and theater. Yeah, you were theater stage kind of mm -hmm. guy. To That's the yeah. foundation, the base, right? Until I moved to Vancouver, yeah. I w which was 2006. Yep. I was primarily a stage actor. And then I moved uh, to Vancouver in 2006 in the hopes of breaking into film and TV out here. And then immediately <laughs> started doing theater out here. Yep. Uh, my big break was I did a Bard on the Beach, which is the Shakespeare Festival. That's of course. Down Kitsilano. So I of played, course. I played Aaron and Titus Andronicus. And I invited my voiceover agent, Caroline Young at Characters, to come see the show and told her, you know, I'd love, I was, I was already signed with Characters in their principal division. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'd love to do voiceover work. If you want to see some of my work, come see my play. She saw the play and was impressed enough that she started hustling for me, even though I had no credits. And 
the rest is history. You know, that's that's really interesting. And the, the from the voice out, I'm right in the middle of um, season two of El Chapo on Netflix. Okay. And this is the one that's this isn't Narcos. Right. This is the one that's produced. It's it's predominantly uh, Spanish speaking, mm-hmm. and they've got English voiceover. Right. Not subtitled. Right. But they they're doing the voiceover that over top. Yeah. And. I'm gonna have to. Ch- I was talking to CEO of Casting Workbook, uh, okay. Susan Fox, mm-hmm. amazing lady, incredible company. I'm gonna have to check if I have to edit this and take this part out because I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm allowed to say this yet. But they are doing groundbreaking stuff, and one of the one of the most important streams right now for actors is voice work. Mm-hmm. And so they're they're the internationalization of a lot of the content that's coming out right, right. now is putting the voiceover right. actor in really high demand. Huh. And as I'm watching El Chapo. I'm surprisingly not bothered by the overdub. Like, I mm. thought, I think it's come a long way from the old, martial you know, arts martial movies. arts movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where sure. it's doing it. And now, now I'm almost sure that I'm getting there. And there's, there's obviously a market for this with all these phones in people's pockets. Mm-hmm. Do you find that that's where the bulk of your work is? Or is it just, am I overthinking it? Is there no, still no. a... You, you raise an interesting point. So it's important for anybody listening at home who's interested in voice, there's different classifications of voiceover acting. Yeah. What I do, which lucky for me happens to be the one that pays the most, is what they call prelay. Yeah. And prelay is when you go in the studio and you do the vocals. There's no animation done uh, yet. And they will draw based on what you do with your voice. Yeah. So it's important to have a really dynamic voice and give a really dynamic performance so the animators have stuff to do. So that's prelay. There's also overdub, which is what you're talking about, which right. is it, it pays less, but there's the volume of it, as you're saying, is pretty big because there's lots of international projects that they're they're getting, you know, English voices for now. And that's a different thing entirely where it's more similar to uh, ADR. And any actor who works in TV knows ADR is like you record, uh, you know, you, you video your stuff on set. And if, like, a plane is going by during one of your lines, you'll go back in studio. They have this, like, beep that will go off so you can match your vo- your vocals to the image on screen. And over overdubbing is more similar to ADR than it is prelay. So most of my work is prelay. Got it. Mm-hmm. That was actually a very helpful little talk. We might cut that little bit out and use that to help people understand that there's this is how complex it's becoming or mm. sophisticated and there is a real market for it. Oh, do yeah. you consider yourself a as an actor? Mm-hmm. Do you differentiate between uh, screen versus voiceover? Is it all acting? How do you see it? How do you define it? Somebody asks, what do you do? What do you say? So I will give a business answer right now. Yeah. The ROI on voice work is exponentially better than film and television. And that is very attractive to me. ROI. Yep. That doesn't mean it pays more. It means the return is better. Are you being this specific with that word? I'm so I'm both. Because you don't have to dress up or do makeup. Not only that. So for let's say I you have a an audition for a principal guest star or lead role in film and television. Yeah. Normally you get your sides the night before. Let's say between four p.m. and seven p.m. And it's not uncommon that your agent will send you eight nine pages of sides if it's a sizable role. Right. For me, I'm not great at memorizing lines, right? So it requires, I would say, three to five hours minimum of time on short notice where you've got you've to cancel whatever you had planned that evening. You've got to lock yourself in a room with another actor right. and run that until you can go in the room the next morning at 10 a.m. and you're comfortable, right? Mm-hmm. If you are the best actor in the city, unless you're a celebrity, if you're the best actor in the city and you're crushing it, your batting average in terms of auditions and bookings is about 20 to 30%. Yeah. So you can imagine if you're a successful actor and you're getting lots of auditions for big roles, that's lots of hours on spec for if it's going well, <laughs> you're booking at a rate of 20%. Right? Really? Oh, that, yeah. If, you're, if, if I booked three out of every 10 auditions I had, I'd be a millionaire. That's incredible. Is there... So do you just want to do that now, or have you fallen uh, into like? Do you, I just sorry? And so let me to back it up too for people that are watching or listening. Omari's CV. You should go to IMDb. Um, some of the really cool things you've done before, even the voiceover work. You did mm-hmm. Continuum. You did mm-hmm. Blue Mountain State. BMS. Yeah. Um, you were in in a host of uh, of movie roles. Uh, you know, small parts, mm-hmm. medium. Also, you are truly a working actor. You've got a couple series under your belt. You mm-hmm. just went. You just finished production on Comic Action, or what was it called? Action. Uh, action Number One. Are we allowed to talk about that? 
Uh, I think it's on IMDb. So it I is. Think, I think so. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but I, more to the point, there's a ton of screen sure. work, if you will, there. Yeah. And then your your voiceover work in the animated world is like, I would say it's almost as big. Yeah. Are I, you, well, when I the thing is when I when I book an animated role, generally speaking, it's a recurring or a series regular. Whereas I might have like, and this is the thing that people don't tell you about IMDb, you might have let's say 50 credits listed on your resume. Right. right? But a credit is like if, if you play like I played Lucas Ingram on Continuum for four seasons. Yes, that's one credit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, really? I think you don't they, get it per episode or season. They used to list it by episode. Uh -huh. They used to have it, but I think they changed it and now. It just says Lucas Ingram Continuum. They don't show you like you know you did whatever thirty two or thirty five episodes, right? Ah. So when you look at my MDB and you see a voice credit, normally that's sure it's one role, but that's like thirteen episodes every season. Whereas if you're in town and you you might have like. 15 Hallmark credits, yeah. but it's 15 days. <laughs> you know what Have I mean? you done any Hallmark movies? I've done a bunch of Hallmark movies. Yeah. Yeah, my mom loves Hallmark movies. My mother-in-law is obsessed with them. Like, yeah. that's amazing. Those are, a, those are a whole genre unto themselves. They are. They I'm, really I'm, are. I'm deciding if I give you the PC answer or if I give you the, the answer of how I actually feel. G give me the answer <laughs> of how you actually feel, and then we can decide after <laughs> right. if you want to take this part out. Uh, if all of a sudden there's a cut right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone will know yeah. you had a great answer. No, but I, whatever. I've talked about this many times on record. Hallmark is a very important employer for, for Vancouver. I know sure. people make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like they, I mean, they've pumped so much into our economy. They shoot tons of movies out here. But... If I'm to be totally honest with myself, I did not get into this business to be playing the friendly cop in Christmas movies. I'm grateful for the paycheck <laughs> when it comes. The friendly cop at Christmas. That's what I usually get cast as. It's the only as. time they're friendly. Yeah, the friendly cop. And, yeah. the, and then there's, I mean, there's a deeper conversation I could talk about in terms of, like, race and Hallmark. Yeah. If you look at the covers of all their oh, movies I... and who all their lead <laughs> actors are, like, they're, they're getting better now. Yeah. But it's this thing now where they'll have, like, the black Hallmark movie. The Diversity Channel. That's yeah. what they should rename it. Yeah. yeah. It's, but it's like this dystopian universe where, like, people of, this, of different races don't interact. Yeah. Like, you'll never see, like, uh, you know, my wife is white, as, as you know. Yes. I've never seen a I mean, Hallmark I, movie. I didn't know. I don't see color, but anyway. No, you don't see yeah, color. But I'll, sure, I'll just sure. tell you, Amy's sure, white. Sure, sure. Yeah. But you'll never see a Hallmark movie where it's, like, <laughs> you know, a black guy and a, a white woman or vice versa. It's, yeah. it's like the white movie, the black movie. So I just have some issues with... They, uh, Hallmark, a little trivia for you, their corporate office, you know where it's based out of? I would guess a red state. Kansas City. Mm -hmm. I know that because when I lived there, when I was working with Sprint for years, they, uh, they were the other big uh, company in town. Sure. And I had a lot of creative staff that would come in between them and Hallmark. Sure. So their channel is a, a oh, critical it's a juggernaut. Yeah. stream for them. Sure. The, the, to the animated stuff, though, Back to that, I want to know, sure. when you get, do you create a lot of backstory for characters that don't necessarily have it as an actor, and do you do the same thing for the voiceover work? Is, is most of the, the prep and all of the, the work that goes into those roles, are mm -hmm. they similar? They are similar, but the advantage with most of the voiceover, the significant voiceover roles I've had, I've played characters that have a pretty long and established history. Yeah, Like, I've got to do the voice of Black Panther since 2012, and I didn't really need to do research because I'm such a big fan. I know the character's backstory, and, yeah. you know, or I, I played Jefferson and Max Steel, and that character also already had a long history, so I would just, like, watch old episodes and get a sense of who he was. And you did, you did Black, which I'm so glad you, you mentioned that. I was going to go there anyway because I've got two sons, and we're all super fans. Mm -hmm. you, did, you did two versions of Black Panther. You did mm -hmm. the... The comic book mm -hmm. animated series, which was super cool and ahead mm -hmm. of its time, mm -hmm. which was like almost like motion graphic yeah, kind of thing. It was an interesting style. Yeah, it's really cool. It's like half comic book, half animation. Yeah, and it yeah. was literally pulled from the comic books, which was super dope. Mm -hmm. And then you also did the, um, what is it, Marvel Super Friends? Yeah, there's, they, they started launching something for young kids. Yes. Uh, and I kind of like Superhero Squad. It's called Marvel Superheroes. Yeah, and it's on Disney XD and it's on YouTube. And I've been very fortunate that someone at Marvel likes me doing the voice, and they they've been asking me to do it since 2012. Oh, you're amazing. Will you? Are you allowed to to go into character and do it right now? I could do some Black Panther, right? Do where when? You, first of all, before you, you have to do it because it's dope. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you did my uh, voicemail at one point, and right. people thought it's Black Panther. <laughs> I've clearly got the wrong number. Um, do you? Who did you pull that from? Like, I guess it wasn't a shocking accent. It's not like all of a sudden you played him Scottish or something. No, no, right. But at yeah. the same time, I was really curious because you had a, you brought it to life and you've done mm -hmm. that twice. 
Um, where do you, where you take a character like that? How did how mm. did you come up with that? What was the origin of that voice? So I'll give you the, the super. I'll give the listeners a super quick lesson on voice acting. Right. Yeah. Every uh, character that you hear in a cartoon is a combination of what resonator in your body you're speaking from and what rhythm you're talking with. Right. And cool. I know that sounds a little nerdy and technical, but like no, no. you can speak through like your your nose and your hands. So yeah, like this voice here, right? That's like your nose resonator. Yeah. If you move right now from here to to your throat, like my regular speaking voice is like in my throat, right? And then heroes like Captain America, Black Panther, they all talk from their chest, so they have this kind of tenure, you know, like this. Oh yeah, right. Okay. And then huge ass characters might have this like deeper voice like this, right? So like I know my natural voice is kind of up here, but because Black Panther's a hero, the first thing that I I did was like. Put them in here, right? So if you speak from this voice, right. and then you change the rhythm, all of a sudden you put an accent on, and you're talking like the Black Panther. Oh, that's cool. But it's 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 really like math. People like it seems like magic until you like break it down and you figure out. And then I, I show my students this, but if you do the same accent but move it through resonators, you have a different character. So the the easy example, right? You got a guy who talks like this. It's one character, same guy. Move him down here. Second character. You got a different guy. He talks like this, right? Like that's all it is. Yeah. It's and that, what resonator and what accent you're you're doing when you do it. I should mention too to everyone watching and listening that Omari is also a distinguished member of our faculty for the acting for film and television program mm -hmm. here at VFS. That's good instruction. You did that sitting down too. Right, can yeah. can does a voice? I mean, how physical is that job? It, it's very physical. Like you, anytime you watch, you would never do that in a thing sitting down, would you? In LA, they they do it sitting. It's pretty Weird. amazing. Really. You know, I mean, you, you can, as you just saw, you can do it, but people, some people don't realize that voice acting is acting, right? So you've got to be a good actor. They're not just going to have you, like, if you can do a sound of a voice, but you're not in the character, it's not going to sell it to people watching at home. Right. So to me, when I'm doing Black Panther in the studio, I'm standing up and I'm moving around. Like, you've got to get engaged in it so that the, uh, the emotions and the voice are transferred onto the screen. And animation, usually it's a little heightened, which is why it's more like theater, so that it comes off the page. Because if you do it in the same way, like, you know, the mumblecore style you see a lot yeah, of TV yeah, shows yeah, in, yeah, yeah. it's just not that interesting, right? Do you ever dress up like Black Panther while you're doing that voice? Do you need any kind of... I'm half kidding, but in a way I'm kind of serious. What, how, much of the, how much of that role or any of those ones do right. you have to... Because you could go in in your sweatpants. I mean, and some people do. Yeah, I, I don't. I've never dressed in costume for any any audition, even on camera. I'll, or dress I'll, up, I should say, or any like. How important is the external armor versus? Do you just go somewhere in your mind and maybe it's not even relevant? What's important is making sure you're you're hydrated and you're grounded. Like like Black Panther, because he's kind of a regal guy. When I'm in studio, I'll like hold myself in a certain way and move in a way that's different from how I would normally move. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't. To me, it's not about like the external costumes. It's just about like getting my body right and my mind right and my voice right. When I see Tom Hanks do Woody from Toy Story, mm -hmm. I think yeah, that's a great example. I think most people would agree with me. Mm -hmm. That's Tom Hanks. And I don't... To some extent, yeah. I yeah. feel like that's mm -hmm. Tom Hanks, and I feel mm -hmm. like I've seen a lot of similar intonation and character stuff across enough of his work mm -hmm. of, of his body of work that, mm -hmm. you know, there you go. But, I mean, you've done from, from Max Steel mm -hmm. to... Uh, you know, B Black Panther. Mm -hmm. um, we gotta mention uh, Dragon Prince. Yeah. On Netflix, going yeah. into season three. Yeah, yeah. Your Corvus. I am. What a crazy, awesome success story! It's pretty wild. Um, yeah. That thing is killing it right now. Everybody yeah. loves it. My kids. Yeah. Everybody loves this cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't hear Omari across mm -hmm. all those, and I. I mm -hmm. watch a lot of your stuff, and I mm -hmm. watch them with my boys. I feel like you found the character. Is that just kind of like in any acting? Sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's it's Val Kilmer being Val Kilmer. I don't know why I picked him. He's actually a dope voice actor. It's funny that you said yeah, that. Yeah, it's but... probably a terrible example. <laughs> Brad Pitt is what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes it's just Brad right. Pitt. Yeah. In every movie versus someone who really goes, you know, Daniel Day Lewis or whatever. Well, what, you strike mm -hmm. me as being on that Daniel Day Lewisy side. Do you, that, is that intentional? I mean. I know you're not saying it in that way, but even to have his name mentioned at the same time as me is very humbling. Yeah, no, I mean that. I but, think you really deliver. Your, you know, none of your characters, when right. I hear them, they sound at all alike. So, and I know it's you. So there, it's this thing where, you know, I tell my students this a lot. There are actors who are really good at being themselves in different situations. Like, I think Tom Cruise is a phenomenal actor that doesn't get nearly as much credit for how good he is. 
Because Tom Cruise, you watch him in Top Gun and you go, I believe that's what Tom Cruise would be like as a fighter pilot. You watch him in, you know, A Few Good Men and you go, I believe that's what he'd be like as a military lawyer. Right. Whereas you watch Daniel Day-Lewis and you're like, oh that's my, Lincoln. I'm watching Abraham Lincoln. Totally. I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, but, yeah. and I don't, to me, I don't judge either one. Personally, and I, I, I'm saying this somewhat facetiously, but I'm not like <laughs> good looking or cool enough to get famous and get successful off of being myself. Like, I'm just not that interesting. You yeah, but you've got saying? a good sense of humor. Like, we've talked about sure, you. Yeah. But, you know, I really would love you to, to, to come in and guest host this. And, you've, you, you know, you've got a real, um, you've got a way of interrelating, mm-hmm. whether that's on screen or even in person, mm-hmm. that I think some actors have a distance between them and they maybe they only right. save that for when the camera's rolling. But you don't ever seem to do that. And I think that's right. maybe more of the appeal than you realize. It's because I'm not cool. I'm telling I'm uh, I'm not even joking. It's no, like, I believe that. Like there are, <laughs> I, I, be, I believe that. Like there are people if you like I don't know, like like <laughs> Tyrese is cool. Yeah. You watch him and you go, I want to watch that guy doing things. And I, I say this with, with no disrespect and with all love. Like I feel like I have way more in common with Wayne Brady than I do <laughs> with Tyrese. You could but, play Wayne Brady in the Wayne Brady biopic. I could. But in Canada, you could. because I'm like a 200-pound black dude, I'm often going in for like more Tyrese roles, which is not my vibe at all, which is why I think I do better in voice. Because you know, when they see me, they're like, give him a gun and make him a tough guy. And anyone who knows me, that's absurd. Is that a, is that a to that point, is it a strategy now in terms of you know, talking about being a working actor? Mm-hmm. Are you and your, you know, your management, are they sitting down and are you guys on the, uh, in the Omari Newton war room are you making a conscious decision to lean more voice or the other? Is that a thing that actors who want to really make it have to do? Like, if you want to really take it long term, can you do it all? What's the, you, what's the thinking there for you? You could go either way, man. You absolutely can. And I know there's some uh, friends of mine who are wonderful actors like uh, Giles Panton or Andrew Francis who are amazing voice actors who also do a lot of uh, on-camera stuff. Yeah. Right now, for where I'm at in my life and my career... The, the lifestyle that comes with being a voice actor interests me more than being... Like, what is required to be a successful film and television actor is incredible amounts of flexibility of, of schedule and time and incredible amounts of, of singular focus. And I just... Because I write and I do voiceover and I, like, I just don't have time to win that game right now. And my agents have been super patient yeah. in allowing me to pursue my other, my other gigs. Because you write, mm-hmm. you direct, you're, you're on stage, you mm-hmm. do... A whole bunch of really eclectic things as a as a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Do you think? Well, le- one other question on the voiceover two thing is: there's no Oscars of voiceover, is there? Uh, is there? No, there's no Oscar. But the, I mean, the, I mean, how do you know? Is it just booking gigs and making a living, and that means you're doing it well? Why don't we recognize mm-hmm. that performance and animated stuff from an? We recognize an animated feature, mm-hmm. but we don't stop and go the best animated mm-hmm. character. Why not? Well, I mean, UBCP has an award for, for voice actors, actually. So they, they'll oh, yeah? recognize people. But I think most voice actors, I think part of the draw is the anonymity. Like, I think it's, uh, to me, being like Tom Cruise level famous would be the worst thing imaginable. It'd be a curse. Whereas I, like, and I've, I've told you'd, my... You'd deal with it. You'd be all right. I mean, I'd be all right with the checks. Sure. But I, I, would, I would rather be the guy who owns the studio than the, the A-list celebrity. Any day of the week. What's the upside to being, like, if you're, like, I don't know, who's a, a mogul that's not problematic? <laughs> <laughs> a mo- like, for, like an actor? Like a, no, like a producer. Like, who's a, like... Oh, uh, Spielberg. Spielberg. Right. Sure. Steven Spielberg. Sure, sure. Although he's a celebrity director, but whatever. Yeah. S- Steven Spielberg can do anything Michael that, Bay. that... Michael Bay, sure. Although but he could be problematic. problematic. Yeah, he's he problematic. problematic. Right. Yeah. But Let's whatever. go Spielberg. So what, whoever the guy who runs Paramount right now is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that guy has all the power and flexibility, and he can do whatever he wants. And if he wants, he can also just, like, walk the seawall. You know what I mean? That's way better than being, like... Yeah, like Bob Iger of Disney exactly. can do that. He can do whatever he wants. Les Moonves can't. Right. But but forget about Les Moonves. Like, we know who he is because we're in the industry. Sure, sure. But, like, forget... I mean, I said Brad Pitt. Forget about Brad Pitt. Like, Robert Pattinson can't go to Starbucks. No. Do you know no. what I'm saying? No, I, I do know what you're saying. It'd be terrible. Yeah, I guess it would. I think it, it probably would. But I think also, um, this is why I'm not famous. The money, the, the money, 
the money would probably make it okay. But Bob or Iger you, has way more money than Robert Pattinson. You skip the dishes now anyway. If Starbucks <laughs> can come to you, whatever. You're, yeah. you're overthinking it. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, if the alternative is like being rich and famous or not being successful, I'd rather be rich and famous. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying I've never actively sought fame. In fact, I actively avoid people knowing who I am. Which is funny for such a, uh, a working actor. You're, you're, you're one of those out there... Um, you, you've made it to that next tier, maybe even the tier above that, where you're you're working and you're making mm-hmm. a living doing. That's a mm-hmm. dream for a lot of people. A lot of students sure. here, a lot mm-hmm. of the, the students at home watching this who are dreaming of it. Did you go into it because it was just what you had to do, or was the the thought of if I can pull it off, the money's pretty good? So that's a great question. When I started acting way back in the '90s, it was pre-social media, and the game was totally different. Mm-hmm. Every one of my generation, like every black actor of my generation, wanted to be Denzel Washington, right? And then like Will Smith came up, we wanted to be Will Smith. Like I, w- I was about the work. Like I started off in theater, so I wanted to be, you know, a well-respected actor. And the craft of acting is what fascinated me. And I'm turning 40 this year, and it's crazy how like a short 20 years later, the game is so different now. It's almost like assumed you've got to have a social media presence and you've got to be like famous. Like I've I've lost roles to YouTubers who've never been on a film set. Yeah, that's that sucks. But for me, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's also a sign of the times. Sure. But you didn't you didn't go into. I mean, you knew you were going to go into this gig and you knew you were going to lose parts to somebody because yeah. this is a job that. And we've talked about this. You know, mm-hmm. it's day in and day out. It's sure. rejection. Yeah. It's kind of messed up. Kinda, that you would yeah. go into a like it's. In a way, it's like having a job interview every day, and you it rarely, if ever, get the job. Yeah, and you're pretty good at it. You've got yeah. a good amount. But what, why do you? Is that you're just wired that way? I so always wonder that with actors, right? What's I just, wrong with you? It's <laughs> so for me, it was something that I was just like in inherently. I had I want to say good at, but I, I had a proclivity for performing. Yeah, I've it, like I I have so many neuroses and anxieties. Like I could I could list the number of neuroses I have. I don't like elevators. I don't like flying. It's a whole thing. But I've net like my one gift that I got from the universe is I'm super comfortable communicating and I'm super comfortable in front of audiences. And I've always been. And it, it's like it's weird that most people's biggest fear is public speaking because the, the one thing I'm good at and not and that does not make me nervous is a very rare thing that's monetizable. And that's just dumb luck. You were always going to be an actor, though. I mean, you were, like you're saying, oh, yeah. like from, from grade three or even around there. That yep. was That's where it was going. Totally. Um, what's the long-term vision for you? You just want to see where it goes? Or have you got any, you know, you dabble and you, you write. I know that right now you're, you, you just finished co-writing something with your wife, who's an amazing playwright yeah. and, and writer in her, in her own regard. Mm-hmm. Do you like doing that side of it? Like that not... Oh, my God, yeah. What, like a more? The, the dream would be to get to act in something that either my wife, Amy Lee Lavoie, wrote or that we wrote together. The, yeah. the, the dream now, I'm much more interested in making inroads on the producer-writer side of things. Yeah. I'm not so much, right now I'm not so interested in directing, but like producing and, and writing really interests me. And I just think it's like, I'm turning 40. Like I've, I've been, for lack of a better term, a foot soldier in the game for a long time. And it's only natural, I think, that you'd want to start thinking like a general eventually. Because it's, I, yeah. I, I feel like in a lot of ways, acting, in, particularly in TV, is a young man's game. In a lot of ways, like which th- which is not to say that your career. I hope that's not true, but you're well, probably right. Well, I think if you look at like, okay, realistically, yeah, at age thirty nine, turning forty this month, the odds of like being discovered and going becoming an A list actor, slim to nil, just numbers wise. As a for, it, it, there are rare cases where it happens, but that's never been my ambition, so I don't care. But if you're, you know, between the age of 15 and let's even say, I don't know, 25, 26, there's a very realistic chance that, you, especially in this town, that you go in for some CW show yeah. or some, and like you could legitimately become a star. Just huge. Yeah. Well, look at Emily Bett Rickards. Yeah. Like totally. got Felicity Smoke and totally. Arrow right out of VFS. Yeah. Quick. And she's set for life. Like, oh, it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I know. I think you're totally right. What, what's your advice to a up and coming or or, or hopeful dreaming uh, prospective actor out there mm-hmm. who's thinking, I want to do voiceover. I want to mm-hmm. do stage. I want. I want to. I want to do the Omari Newton program. Mm-hmm. Would you say do that program, or would you say specialize, focus early? What in today's environment and industry, what's the what's the smart play? I think diversification is always really smart. 
I think I came to have a diversified career because of, and I, this again, it sounds like I'm joking, but I'm not. I failed in a lot of different areas, which forced me to try different things. Right. When I moved here, I wanted to do film and TV. I couldn't catch a cold, so I kept doing theater, right? Really? Then, yeah, yeah, truly. And then I, I booked that Shakespeare Festival. I went back to my roots in theater, which led to a career in voice. Isn't Christopher Gay, speaking of voices, mm-hmm. Christopher Gay? He's got a great voice, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. He's one of my all-time, I love working with him yeah. the, from Bart on the Beach. If you've never heard Christopher Gay's speaking to a microphone. Oh, it's beautiful. What a I think uh, almost can you be a successful voiceover actor without some of that stage? I feel like there's a real inherent uh, study of that like you're talking about voice that that comes naturally from stage yeah. that you don't always get on screen. Yeah, I think there there's always people who are naturals. Yeah. Like the lead in Dragon Prince is like a 9-year-old girl. Her first credit is really? the lead in Dragon Prince and she's just Good. What a great program. Do you love that? Do you love that series? I love that series. Fun for you. I love that series. I love killing. I love fantasy. The diversity angle is incredible. The role I get to play is cool. It's got a rabid fan base. But like, yeah, it's it's a season three was announced. Season three was announced, and the the creators, uh, the coolest guys, they created uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yeah. But they're the most humble dudes. Like they're they're constantly like saying nice things about myself and other cast members on Twitter, and I'm just like, you don't have to do this. It's awesome. But I love hearing that. Yeah. Do you and it, well, how does that one work for Dragon Prince? Are you an ensemble together recording, or is that in the booth solo with the director? We are an ensemble together. Most of us, which is kind of pretty amazing. Shout out to Vancouver. Most of us, including the lead girl, are local Vancouver actors. Oh wow! There's one actor who they brought in from LA. He comes in from LA, and he was originally on Avatar: The Last Airbender. A super cool guy, but most of it is Vancouver cast. Um, on that note, I want to do something really fun here. I want to mm-hmm. play a little game with you for a second here before mm-hmm. we before we wrap. I want to I want to do the uh, a little bit I like to do with the the working actor on the how well do you know yourself quiz. Oh boy. Okay. Um, and I would really like you to do this with your sunglasses on. Oh, okay. Just well, because I think they will get missed by if you're listening at home, you don't know what you're missing. You got to watch this podcast. This is going to increase got, my cool factor. Maybe now yeah. get Tyrese's career. Let's see if Omari Newton knows himself really well. Uh, ten questions. Okay. I'm hoping that you would be able to get a ten out of ten. This is all about you. <laughs> okay. Question number one. As of today, and let's call this November of 2019. Uh huh. How many acting credits do you have on IMDb? Oh my God. I don't. I have no idea. You don't I, take a guess. Uh, uh, like individual credits, or how many? How many acting? God. Like on camera? When you say acting, what do you mean? Like voiceover or? Well, whatever IMDb says. Acting. Uh, acting credits. 55. You are wrong. But very good guess. It's 54. Oh, wow. I will give it to you. Okay. I will give it they to you. They might have added one. They might have added one. No, as of today, it's 54. Okay. Unless you know one that's coming. No, but no, okay. that's as of right. today. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Let's talk about some of the, 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 the Marvel superhero voiceover work you've done. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> um, you played Black Panthers. We've discussed yep. on a couple things. Yep. Um, one of your uh, voiceover colleagues mm-hmm. in Marvel Super Friends, mm-hmm. Michael Dobson, yep. uh, who is the voice of Ultron, yep. like you, has also played other characters and other things. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Dobson was in Marvel's X-Men Evolution animated series, what other character did he play? Okay, this is a total guess. I know Michael Dawson really well. We worked together on Max Steel. Yeah. He, he always does big, large, powerful voices. So I'm going to guess he did Juggernaut. You are incorrect. Michael Dobson, if you're watching, I'm sorry that Omari wasn't paying attention when he was working with you. It's the blob, Freddie uh, But uh, Freddie I was in the wheelhouse. You definitely were, but I'm not going to give it to you. Sorry, Michael. Uh, Let's talk. Here's another one you do that I think is amazing that most people probably don't know. Corner Gas, the series, the TV series. I play multiple you, roles. You on are that. you are Nate and other roles yep. on the animated series. I am, which is which is doing really well too. Mm-hmm. It's quite popular. It is. However, based on the show, <laughs> which is more critically acclaimed currently, based on the IMDb Pro rating? Is it Corner Gas, the TV series, or Corner Gas, the animated series of which you are an actor, voice actor on? Critically acclaimed, like critically, according, according to like score on IMDb. Oh my Pro. god, people love Corner Guess. The original series is why we have an animated series. I'm trying to think though, is it like a benefit to be on longer for critical? I'm gonna go with the the original series is more critically acclaimed. You are correct. It has an eight. It scores an eight out of ten. Yeah. Versus your your work on the animated one is only getting a seven point two. 
That's hurtful. not bad. That's hurtful. And I'm sorry, uh, Brett Butt and the cast for bringing down the rating of your show. Yeah, I just thought Clearly, it was important to know yourself. Reason. Yeah. Do you read your reviews and things like that? Do you do that? I read my reviews. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. How does that go? Are you? Does it? Does it wreck you, or is it? I'm completely indifferent. That's good. You're going to need to be. The, this is going to hurt as we go deeper. Here. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Max, <laughs> Max Steele, the TV series, animated TV series. You have actually played two other voice characters yep. on Max Steele, oh my God. aside from Jefferson Smith. Yep. Who were those characters that oh you played? Oh, my God. I think I played an, an N-Tech technician, and I played, uh, I don't know, like a guy at a park. You were wrong. Oh. You played a museum guard and... <laughs> A THI technician. Maybe well, that's, uh, I'll, come give, on. You, that I'll was, give you a point for that. We did 30-something episodes. So in voiceover, you get a secondary character. Like, if you're a main dude, they'll just be like, can you do that voice too? So yeah. in my defense. But you didn't even know. Like, you, when you were playing Museum Guard, you weren't really I mean, it's one of my backstory. most important credits. Yeah, I thought so too. But you didn't have a backstory. Um, question number five. Est-ce que tu peux vraiment parler français? Mais oui, j'étais né à Montréal. Je suis complètement bilingue. Absolument? Oui. C'est si, certain, c'est la dernière réponse. Je suis aussi bilingue que Trudeau. All right. <laughs> you do speak French, which IMDb yep. claims you do, and you have passed that. I will give you I've worked in that. French. Yeah, I, I, I believe you now. Mm-hmm. Uh, question number six, Blue Mountain State, mm-hmm. on that show. Anyone, any fans out there, there's a lot of them. Season three, mm-hmm. episode 11. Death Penalty was the name of that episode. Okay. You played Larry Summers. And in this episode, BMS is excited. They are going to a bowl championship game against what other rival school? Uh, wait, that's what we played a game in a cornfield, and we played against was it Midland? Final answer. The Blue Men State played against. I'm going to say Midland. You are incorrect. It was Blackwell. Come oh, on, Blackwell Collegiate. I don't, I've been doing this a long time. Such a time. good episode. I'm sorry. And, uh, that I, is shameful. How do I? You I don't was know on yourself. These things. No, I don't know myself. You don't know yourself. Sorry, uh, BMS fans. Let's talk about uh, Dragon Prince again. Let's. I, I cannot understate what an amazing job you do in that whole cast. If you have not seen this animated series, it's so great. If you're a grown up or a big kid, anything in between, you're going to love this. It's on Netflix now. Season three is coming out soon. You play Corvus. Yep. What is the official Rotten Tomatoes rating for both season one and or season two? The official rating? Rot- it's it's got to be high because it, the show's doing well. Yep. And it's Rotten Tomatoes. They could be merciless. But I'm going to go 8.9. You're incorrect. Both score 100% really? on Rotten Tomatoes. 100%? Yeah. Damn. Damn. Yeah. Wow. It is 100%? 100%, both season one and two. Everyone like, likes the, Dragon Prince? It's killing it. Man. Thanks, guys. you got to know that. And I'm you, actually, should be, you should be very proud of that. I'm actually doing a signing at a comic shop in North Vancouver on November 24th. If I was a better promoter, I would have the exact name. Oh, we'll, so. we'll tweet that out. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, but hold, hold on. Okay. Of all the animated voiceover roles you've had, yep. according to Rotten Tomatoes... <laughs> <laughs> Which one is the worst? Which one has the they lowest? They rank individual oh shows. You're yeah, saying? not you, not your oh. performance. Oh, but of all the ones you've done, which which of your animated series that you've done? I think I know this. Is the lowest rated. So this is not disrespecting the show, but Max Steel was a remake of a show that people really liked, and I think people were mad about the remake. So I'm going to help you out on this one. It's not that. It's not Max Steel. It's not that. Of all the animated shows I've done, which has the worst? You can't be. B- Dragon is, Prince, 100%. You're killing it. Is it for girls or guys? I'm not telling you that, but that I'd be leading the witness. It's a Barbie movie. You are correct. Rock and Royals, Barbie. Yes, yes, it is. One for ten, baby. You are uh, Barbie in Rock and Royals. I believe you played Marcus. I did. Uh, who was Marcus? Marcus was just basically Black Ken, but a teenager. Oh, really? Basically. You got a 46% Rotten Sweet. Tomatoes score on that. Awesome. Not, uh, your, not your best project, but that's no. okay. But you know, that's okay. you know what? I'll give a and great. You don't do it for the for the Rotten Tomatoes. But I'll give a great review, and I'll, for anyone listening at home who gave it a poor review, uh, I gave the check I got ten out of ten. <laughs> so <laughs> take did. that, that's bad excellent. reviewers. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit of question nine here, mm-hmm. wrapping this up. Uh, mm-hmm. A little Black Panther trivia. <laughs> I know that's a character near and dear to your heart. Yep. Um, he is one of the biggest, most popular ones in the Marvel universe right uh-huh. now. Um, let's look at. You saw the movie, of course, three times uh, in theaters. 
there is a very significant, and you play him in multiple animated things. Uh-huh. Uh huh. One significant <laughs> and very distinguishable difference between Nakia in the movie mm-hmm. versus the comic book, of which I know you did a lot of background research. Okay. There's something very We're different. We're ending this if I get it wrong. Yeah. This, <laughs> if you know this, I'll be really impressed. If you know his backstory, what's the difference between Nakia in the movie versus the comic books? That's the so the what's the one he has a crush on the one he loves. Yes, she in the movie yeah. is like with Wakandan intelligence. Yeah, and she's out doing stuff. It's kind of his love interest. Yeah, in the comic books, different. Which comic books? The Marvel comic books. But like the Tiny Hossie, Hossie Coates one. Like the okay, new so one this is the, how yeah. you are going to try to back yourself yeah. up by forcing me follow, on the defensive. I follow politics. Yeah, that's I'm going to deflect that's fair. this question. Uh, I don't know. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, yeah. that depends on which version of Black Panther. So I'm going to... Is she... Are they are they lovers in, in yes. both the comic and the... Yes. But in the comic book, she is not with Wakandan intelligence. She is... Is she a member of the Dora Milaje? Correct. But I feel like you were guessing. Well done. I was guessing. But my knowledge, my vast knowledge yeah. of BP led me to that logical yes. guess. Yes, yes. So, in many ways, it's kind of like Whitney Houston in The Bodyguard. <laughs> Only Black Panther is Whitney Houston, and she is Kevin Costner. Yeah. And in the comics, there's that little bit of a, ooh, you, you, can you be in love with your bodyguard? Right. They didn't really go there in the movie. Okay. So, I'm glad, so you got a point for that. Thank you. You're doing okay. You're Thank doing, you. you're, 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 you're seven for nine. You're about to go possibly <laughs> eight for ten. According to IMDb, final question, you have three official nicknames. What are they? I know O Dog is one of them. <laughs> o Dog, correct. Um, I mean, o- people used to call me O Doggy or Doggy. Spoon is one of them. Final answer? Yeah, I don't know. I had a lot of nicknames. Yeah, you should read your IMDb page. You should know yourself. Uh, Omar. Yep. Yep. O. Yeah, that's true. Just I, O. I knew that. And you did get O Dog. Okay. Which you only get partial marks for. Right. So for all the fans out there, just know that O Dog got a seven out of ten. Not bad for knowing himself. I feel like that's a sign of, of humility. I feel like I'd be a narcissist if I knew everything about my MDB. You're probably right. You're probably right. Um, I love any time we get to hang out. Um, really, man, you're you are such an inspiration to a lot of young actors and actors, even where you are today, that want to go and live that dream. You're so humble about it. And I think there's a lot of people that can, can really take from the stuff that you're talking about on your social and the, and the stuff you do. I love any time I can get you for an interview. I hope you'll come back, yeah. chat some time with us. I hope you'll come co-host this sometime and, I'd love to. and take over, man. There's, there's a few people that I would love to see on the other side of this and see your take on it. Um, talking with Omari Newton, the actor, the writer, the director, the voiceover actor. Um, you can find him in a whole bunch of really cool places. Uh, Dragon Prince Season 3 is coming out real soon. There's probably another project we can't talk about just yet, um, but I'm hoping by, by the time we get this tear, we'll be able to put a little plug for you. But always awesome to see you, man. Come back again real soon. Thank you for having me. Anytime, anytime.